me. Welcome back to Pirate Radio Night here on the Red Channel 186. Now, John Ross Barnard, after he'd come off the fort, decided to go and join Radio England, which is on the ship. What was that like, John? Actually, it was much better than the forts. Was it? Well, it was much more professional. The people I was working with were American broadcasters. Mm -hmm. They knew exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. They had perfect jingles, which, of course, the other boats immediately ripped off. Mm -hmm. But actually, it was a much better station to work for. Was it really? Yeah. So it was, were they Americans that were employing you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how did they come to find you? Well, uh, I um, was very fortunate. I wanted to read the news. The only reason I wanted to join the BBC was to read the news, which eventually I managed to do. Mm. But then the Americans couldn't pronounce many of the... The, the words that they were required to. Sure. You know, news stories about Worcestershire, not to mention Scunthorpe, <laughs> were a real problem for them. <laughs> so I was invited to go and read the news mm. on Radio England, Britain mm. Radio, mm. really to tone down the sort of high American voice uh, and give a bit of um, Englishness, if sure. you like, to the sure. station. Sure, excellent. And what was, what was the pay good? The pay was double what I've been getting was elsewhere. Yeah. Um, I'd actually been offered a job on Radio Caroline to read the news there. Uh -huh. um, but when I realised how much more money I'd make on Radio England, Graham Spider Webb said to me, you're mad, John, if you go to Caroline. Go to Radio England. <laughs> Take the money and run. <laughs> I like your style. All right, well, thanks, John. Thanks for joining us. We're now going to see what life was like on Radio England right here on Pirate Radio Night. It had been the idea of Don Pearson and Tom Danaher to start Radio London in 1964. Less than two years later, Don Pearson and Tom Danaher were back in Miami, Florida, fitting out a super station. This time, a more powerful setup, plus two stations on one ship, in what would prove to be the highest profile launch of any offshore radio station during the 1960s. A dispute with Radio London's shareholders and management had caused Don and Tom to split from Radio London and decided to run a radio station for the UK along the lines of how they felt it should be done. An ex-Second World War Liberty ship, the Olga Patricia, later renamed the Laissez-Faire, would be the base for swinging Radio England, a slick top 40 station with mainly American DJs. And Britain Radio, a sweet music MOR station targeted at an older audience. The ship was fitted out with two brand new 50 kilowatt continental electronics transmitters and a 210 foot radio mast. Radio England and Britain Radio could claim to be the best equipped of all the offshore pirate stations of the 1960s. The new radio ship leaves Miami heading for the UK coast but many technical problems were to await including losing part of the transmitting mast mid-Atlantic but the stations would also have the very latest jingle packages from PAMS in Dallas. SRE would have Series 27, the jet set. Swinging Radio England. And sister station Britain Radio would have the sister package from PAM, Series 27, the Smart Set. Swinging, smart, satisfying sounds, sharp and syncopated. Sparkling and smooth, stimulating sounds, chic, sophisticated. Hallmark of quality, Britain Radio. Wonderful music. Swing it radio England where the action is You get a positive charge here on Swing and Radio England England 
England's finest. Swing and Radio England, where the music is news. Swing and Radio England. The fastest thing in the air. Swing and Radio England. In the summer of 1966, Radio England purchased another jingle package, this time from Spot Productions in Dallas. The package was called That Man. The Olga Patricia was heading for Lisbon in Portugal, where repairs and additional equipment could be put on board. This is the company's lawyer, Bob Thornton. Who is this really? It must have been a welcome sight to see the coast of Portugal and to know the project was nearing an on-air date, so desperately needed by the backers. You are listening to the arch adversary, the nemesis of that sound. Unswinging radio. about this for a Portuguese Batmobile. Additional repairs and work was needed to the ship. Attention to the transmitting mast. Technicians from Continental Electronics and local labour undertook the work to ensure the new radio ship could be on her way to the UK coast. In swing in England, we pamper people. So won't you unwind your weekend with us? Boss jocks Ron O'Quinn and Jerry Smithwick, and the boss himself, Don Pearson. Bop, 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 bop. 
Radio. Boss Radio. By May 1966, the Olga Patricia is finally moored off the Essex coast and on the air. Now is 3.30 on May the 3rd, 1966. First day on the air for Swinging Radio England. A further step in the pirate radio battle has now been taken by the appearance of this ship, the 480-ton Panamanian-registered Olga Patricia. Suitably renamed for her illegal existence in the North Sea as the Laissez Faire. Another ship bringing the grand total of offshore radio ships round the British coast to nearly a dozen. Most of these ships are concentrated in the south, but in the north too the numbers are rising with Radio Caroline North and Radio Scotland. And there's Radio 270 off Scarborough. But it's in the south that the map really starts to get crowded. There's Radio London, Radio Tower, Radio Caroline. There's Radio Essex, Radio 390, Radio City. And, about to start shortly, Radio Channel. And that's not to mention the biggest and most ambitious of them all. Swinging Radio England, broadcasting 24 hours of pop a day, and Radio Britain, 21 hours of light music a day, both from the same ship, the Laissez-Faire. So Harwich recently has been the scene of some activity as the world's unseaworthy press has thronged here to make the short but um, rather uncomfortable North Sea voyage out to take a peep at the newest arrival. Their interest is largely born of the financial figures recently released by the pirates, the figures that form the basis of battle between them all. So far, advertisers have been paying the pirates at the rate of two and a half million pounds a year. And that's big money, not without reason did the economist describe the situation as the printing of money without a license. In one important respect, these swinging Radio England and Radio Britain stations are different from all their rivals. They will transmit programmes on a national basis with two 55 kilowatt transmitters. None of the other ships have national coverage, not even Radio London, the second biggest organisation, for her transmitter has only a 50 kilowatt output. Swinging Radio England is taking itself fairly seriously. It has a top London public relations firm working for it, and the venture is backed by a consortium of Britons, Canadians and Americans, mainly Texans. Among the disc jockeys, a mid-Atlantic accent is the order of the day. Eight of them share the job, getting switched on for two weeks on board and off for one week on shore. Their programme director is 23-year-old Mr. Ron O'Quinn. Mr. O'Quinn, you strike me as very young to be a program director. How did this come about? Uh, quite an odd thing, Michael. I was working in Miami at a radio station in Miami and uh, was approached one uh, Saturday afternoon by a gentleman I'd never met before who uh, wishes to remain anonymous. In fact, I haven't seen him since. And uh, asked me how would I like to come to England, which struck me as being quite funny because I was pretty happy in Miami with the weather, etc. And uh, after explaining it to me about Radio England, it seemed quite a challenge, so here I am. Why on earth do you want to go to sea? Uh, I didn't really want to go to sea, but the uh, British government won't allow us ashore, so there we are again. Why have you got two stations on board this ship? We think there's a definite uh, opening for a station of Britain Radio's caliber because of the fact that we aren't competing with really anybody and the fact that we're playing music uh, about 20 hours a day, continuous light music for, uh, for the housewives and people who don't want to be bothered with a with a disc jockey on the air and having to listen to the disc jockey, et cetera, they've got background music provided for them. What about the other stations? Uh, Radio England will provide a definite competition for the existing offshore stations. Uh, the fact that we'll be on 24 hours a day, and we hope to have a, a completely different sound from what they have. We're going to stress personality all the way. But it'll be pops, basically. Pop, yes. This is quite an enterprise. How much does it cost to set up this uh, station? Uh, in excess of one million pounds. Well, where does that sort of money come from? Uh, from British, Canadian and American investors. You can't name any of them? 
No, I certainly can. Well, you probably know the Postmaster General, I don't think, takes a very kind view of pirate ships at the moment. What's your reaction to the fact that you might have only a, a year to live? Uh, well, actually, I think that it'll be about 18 months, from the uh, best I understand, before any action is uh, really put before Parliament. And uh, governments being governments, no matter whose government it is, they're known procrastinators and uh, might take a little longer than 18 months. But if we have to move out, they probably will extend the uh, limit to 12 miles, and with our power, we still won't be bothered too much. Would you still be able to cover the entire country 12 miles out? Uh, I wouldn't know about that. I'm not an engineer, but I, I hesitated you know, to, to answer that because I don't think we would, but we'd still cover... Uh, our definite area with, uh, with London. But from what you say, it seems that you're determined to stay one way or the other. Uh, yes, and we have an alternate plan. If, uh, if England uh, falls through, we have an alternate plan. For another country? Yes. How worthwhile is it to you to defy possible government legislation to stop you being here? Uh, I think, as you already know, the existing offshore stations uh, have made quite a lot of money out of... Uh, the uh, offshore broadcasting. We already have uh, in excess of 300,000 pounds committed to before going on the air. So we're here to make money. Uh, of course, we'd like to make friends with it, but uh, money is our, uh, the real answer, and uh, it's definitely here to be made. But aren't you reliant on uh, British shores for uh, provisioning your ship? Uh, not really. We're uh, relying on Holland. Our uh, tenders are from England, but they pick up our supplies in Holland. Uh-huh. Would, would, would you move to Holland if you were banned from our shores? Uh, I don't think so. I'd, I'd be afraid, uh, really, to answer that because I, I really don't know Plan B. Uh, pirates off other shores have been boarded before today by uh, governments. Would you uh, be prepared to repel borders? No, certainly not. <laughs> I'm not a fighter. This is Swing and Radio England. You get a positive charge here on... Radio Fifteen minutes after eight o'clock, much more music time now with David Valentine. You want a real true the Queen's speech at the opening of the present parliamentary session ignored the radio pirates. But the all-American feel to this, the largest pirate ship yet, with its American disc jockeys and its American money, is unlikely to do the pirate cause any political good. Although for the time being, it certainly means fiercer competition in a part of the North Sea that's fast becoming airtight. Are the pop pirates here to stay? More questions in the Commons this afternoon. Broadcasting daily on 299 meters on the medium wave band, this is Radio City, your swinging tower of power. Remember, Big L is pocket size. Listen to Big L Mighty Summertime Sunshine Sounds wherever you go. This is Radio Caroline on 199 Meters, your all-day music station, Britain's first commercial radio station. My name's Tom Lodge, your disc jockey for the next hour. Life aboard the ocean and radio waves certainly has its attractions despite postmaster generals. It was a postmaster general, Mr. Reginald Bevins, under the last Conservative government, who made the prediction that if the government didn't act against pop pirates, the coasts of Britain would soon be ringed by an armada of pot pirate ships. Well, there's the latest in the armada. It's just arrived, and it's got two radio stations aboard which will transmit for 24 hours. It's a former American Liberty boat, the Olga Patricia, which is to be renamed the Laissez-Faire, which roughly translated from the French means, leave us alone to make our money. And at the moment, it looks as if the pot pirates will be left alone and are making money. It all started in April 1964 with Radio Caroline. Caroline now has two ships covering most of Britain between them. The Pop Pirates' next target, disused Akak forts in the Thames estuary. The biggest houses Radio 390, 
an artful purveyor of mood music rather than pop, estimated audience nearly two million. And Radio City, formerly owned by Screaming Lord Such, pumps out pop from shivering sands. A further million are claimed by Tiny Radio Essex, the first round-the-clock pirate station. In the Clyde estuary, Scotland's pop pioneer. Radio Scotland claims two and a half million listeners with strong local allegiance. And hoping to climb on the bandwagon soon, Yorkshire's Radio 270 and Tower Radio off the East Coast, near Harwich, where the really big guns are. Led by Radio London, the biggest of the pirates, with a weekly audience of over 10 million. Nearby, the new challenger, the two-station pirate ship Radio England and Britain Radio. Over the whole of Great Britain, side by side with the BBC, there now exists a complete but illegal commercial radio service. Although governments have continually threatened all the pirates, starting with Caroline, no action has ever been taken. The ships broadcast just outside the three-mile territorial limit, so they come under no country's law. Even the pirates on the forts have been left untouched. Built in the war, the forts appear to belong to the Ministry of Defence, but the Ministry say it would be too dangerous to remove the pirates from them. Radio London, self-styled, the mast with the most, is the Pirate King. For 17 and a half hours a day, it provides the top pops. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, little ones and kittens, this is the Stu Clark Show with Mike Lennox from now until 6 o'clock. We're going to have a good time. It's a rave-up afternoon. Out now for the number five sounds from the big L fabulous Woody. This is Roy C. Here comes the bride of shotgun wedding. Most pirates now pay record royalties, but the whole economic success of pirate radio is based on the unlimited use of records. The BBC is rationed in its use by the so-called needle time agreement with the record companies, which restricts record time to protect musicians' jobs. London has pulled ahead of its rivals with non-stop pops in the fast and furious American style. It's currently billing £100,000 a month in ads. DJs on London get up to £50 a week. They have two weeks on ship, one on shore. Strong stomachs are needed to keep this down in the North Sea gales, which really rock the tall-masted radio ships. The pop pirate's world is a competitive one. Claims and counterclaims run riot. Yet finally you feel that they've come to form one big floating pressure group to push the government into setting up commercial radio on land. Philip Birch, managing director of Radio London, put the pirate's point of view this way. Uh, what we do know is that we have demonstrated that, again, our, our audience of 10 million people like to be able to tune into um, to, to popular music um, when it suits them. Um, as I say, possibly in the middle of the night, um, and not to be restricted by, in, in an artificial sense, by needle time. Um, on the other point to remember on this, of course, is that uh, it is not cheap to run a radio station at sea. It's a very expensive operation. Uh, keeping a, a, a ship of, of, of this size at sea, manned all the time with a crew of 30, um, is an expensive way to run a radio station. It would be much more economical to, to bring it ashore, as we hope the government will let us. But the prospects at sea are still tempting enough for swinging Radio England, the latest pirate recruit. Ambitiously, it plans to transmit two programmes, one pop, one mood music. It hopes to start this weekend, but formidable technical snags have so far limited it to tests alone. Testing now for Swinging Radio England, we're sending out a brand new test signal for a new sound. For the British Isles, give a listen to Swinging Radio England. Stay with the fun. Woohee! Hear all the hits on Swinging Radio England. The fun spot. Bill Vick 
Drake from Texas is the managing director of American-backed Radio England. Does he fear that the government will act against the pop pirates? Well, of course, that's a fear that we learn to live with. Uh, in any business, would you, you do take a calculated risk. And uh, I feel like that uh, Mr. Wedgwood Ben has uh, said that he would pass legislation, and I feel like he'll certainly keep his word. But obviously uh, not keep it uh, soon enough to stop you making money. Well, let, let's hope that he will uh, find other things that will keep him busy enough to a while anyway. What's, the, what, what's your calculation, that it will be far off? The uh, legislation? I couldn't really guess because I'm not that familiar with the legislative, legislative procedures over here. But uh, I've had some people tell me that they did estimate 18 months. So what can be done to stop the pop pirates? One solution, use force. The Dutch did 18 months ago. They seized a pirate radio and TV tower in a dawn swoop by police and navy by simply declaring it an island because it rested on the seabed. It was silenced in mid-pop. Another solution, sanctions. Scandinavian countries have already adopted this course to great effect against their pirate radios, penalizing advertisers and suppliers. It could be tried on the British pirates. The offshore tenders are the pirates' lifeline. For their daily rations, they rely on British firms who stock up the supply boats. On 242 meters in the medium wave band, this is Radio Scotland. Ironically, the pirates wouldn't get their fan mail without the cooperation of their arch enemy, the GPO. It's the GPO who complain that the pirates endanger shipping by cluttering up the radio waves and interfere with European radio reception. The pirates dismiss both charges. They're stealing the copyright and paying no money for it. They're playing records that musicians have recorded and giving them no money for it. They're endangering the ship-to-shore radio and there's a real risk that distress at sea might not be reported because of the inadequate fumbling handling of equipment. The pirates are a menace and I don't believe at all that uh, the public wouldn't support action to enforce the law in the interests of all these people whom I've mentioned, quite aside from interference in other countries. Well then, can you say that the pirates will be off the air by the end of next year, or any way that legislation will be enforced to, to take them off the air? I can't peer into a crystal ball, but I can say this, that um, this government, and I believe uh, any government, would enforce uh, existing law, uh, would uh, carry legislation through, and that the pirate radio ships have no future at all. I'm quite con convinced of that. And I think the sooner they're convinced of it, the better. It's necessary to prevent chaos in broadcasting in Europe. The medium wavelengths are all allocated to various countries by an international agreement. We've got our allotment in this country. The pirate stations pinch these medium wavelengths, and it means, of course, that in other countries, they very often can't hear their own local station because of our pirates. This is especially the case in Sweden. That's the first reason. The second reason is that these uh, nine or ten ships around our shores are a hazard to shipping because of the interference with radio communications. And uh, uh, thirdly, of course, we uh, live under the rule of law in this country, and these people are acting quite illegally, and uh, it's no good complaining about lawlessness in our towns and cities if they can cock a snook at the law on the seas around our shores. And how will the bill achieve your object? Well, the bill uh, is aimed at doing this without violence, of course, without boarding parties and gunboats and this sort of thing. Um, the offence, the, the broadcasting itself is an offence, will, be, will become an offence, but it also becomes an offence to either place advertising with the pirate ships or to supply them with records or equipment or food or anything of that kind. After force and sanctions, a third choice is open to the Postmaster General to give commercial radio legal status on shore. You're a winner with Swingin' Radio England. This is Swingin' Radio England. You get a positive charge here on Swingin' Radio England. Fifteen minutes after eight o'clock, much more music time now with David Valentine. 
Oh, Ron, swinging Radio England indeed. Now, you claim a new broadcast sound from this pop-powered radio station. What is new about it? Uh, I think the basic uh, new thing that we're going to do is the fact that we are going to stress a personality uh, on the air. It's something that has not been done yet. Uh, the offshore existing offshore stations, we're going to have a, our announcers on for three hours at a time. And uh, during that time, they'll be play, playing the same music that everybody else plays. Uh, but they will throw in gimmicks, personality traits, etc., that uh, the listener can associate with a particular disc jockey that's on the air at the time. You really don't think the other stations, like, say, London and Caroline, are doing this now? Uh, to a certain degree, but uh, not the way it should be done. Bam! Oh, no, not by any means. Uh, we uh, feel like that in a competitive field, we must try to offer a little more, though. Uh, we want to get good coverage, good sound coverage uh, in the majority of the British Isles, and we feel like that this is the power required to do so. Now, you are an American. Uh, at least half of the disc jockeys are Americans. Is this a, an American takeover bit? Have you been watching the progress of our pirate stations here and you've decided to come and really sweep the market? No, it's not really an American takeover bit. It's just uh, that uh, we feel like that uh, the disc jockeys that we have, the uh, people that are involved in this, uh, did see that it was a good venture and decided they'd like to participate. You've invested about one million pounds in this vessel. Is, is this fair enough? Uh, it's been guessed from a million to three million. Well, you're spending, say, at least one million pounds here. You must be pretty confident then that the Postmaster General isn't going to legislate against pirate radio stations. Is this right? I won't say we're confident. I'll say that uh, we feel like that we right now operate uh, in a legitimate fashion, and whatever legislation is passed, then we will abide by it. Radio England would broadcast for just six months and close in November 1966. Britain Radio would continue until February 1967, but the laissez-faire would remain at anchor until August, broadcasting under contract the stations of Radio Dolphin, Radio 227 and Radio 355. But various problems with crew seemed to keep the station in the news. What happened before yesterday? Well, it was a very happy ship. Before Lukas come on board, the captain, he tried to stop everything. We have two beers a day, and he stopped it. Did this annoy you? Yes, I'm not drink, but I do it for the boys that I talk with them. What else did the captain do that annoyed you? Well, make mistakes with anchors. He gave me plenty of work. Yes, sir. plenty of work. Was it hard work that you didn't like? Yes. Well, I like hard work, but not when a captain make mistake after mistakes. What happened yesterday? He tried to catch them off the ship with his foot and his stomach back on the offshore. Did the disc jockeys help you during this incident? Yes, they helped. We stayed together. We went and write a letter to the company that he go off or we go all together off. How many crew members are left on board? Now, only one crew member. That's Cook. Can the ship continue with just one crew member? No. You need no, two, no. two or three sailors you need. It's not possible. Not possible. So is the laissez fair a happy ship now? Not now. Before he come on board, he was a very happy ship. Swinging Radio England
This is Pirate Radio Night. We're on Frinton Beach and we're celebrating the great radio stations of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. Coming up after the break, my guest will be the Emperor Roscoe, who was on Radio Caroline in the 1960s, and we'll be seeing what it was like to spend a day on Radio Caroline in the 1980s.